any time we're just going to dive into the word i do have a cup with me because it is a sunday morning so if you do have tea or coffee grab that as we jump straight into the word for today um so we're gonna i'm gonna be uh preaching from chapter well joshua from the book of joshua chapter six i'm gonna read from verse one to sixteen and then twenty and then we'll go into the word for today so if you have your bibles uh, just turn with me to Joshua 6. I'm going to be reading from verse 1. I'm going to be reading the easy to read version because I find that it's easier for me to understand scriptures that way. Um, but feel free to read it in any version that you, you find helps you better understand that chapter. So it reads, The gates of the city of Jericho were closed. The people in the city were afraid because the Israelites were near. No one went into the city and no one came out. Then the Lord said to Joshua, look, I will let you defeat the city of Jericho. You will defeat the king and all the fighting men in the city. March around the city with your army once every day for six days. Tell seven of the priests to carry trumpets made from the horns of male sheep and to march in front of the priests who are carrying the holy box. That's the Ark of God. But in the easy transla translation, it's called the holy box, but we're referring to the Ark of God. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times and tell the priests to blow the trumpets while they march. They will make one loud noise from the trumpets. When you hear that noise, tell all the people to begin shouting. When you do this, the walls of the city will fall down and your people will be able to go straight into the city. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests together and said to them, carry the holy box of the Lord. Tell seven priests to carry the trumpets and march in front of it. Then Joshua ordered the people, now go, march around the city. The soldiers with weapons will march in front of the holy box of the Lord. After Joshua finished speaking to the people, the seven priests with the trumpets began marching before the Lord, blowing the trumpets as they marched. The priests carrying the Lord's holy box followed them. The soldiers with weapons marched in front of the priests who were blowing the horns and the rest of the men walked behind the holy box marching and blowing their trumpets i really like that you know the writer of this chapter made it so descriptive so we knew exactly what it looked like in what order everybody was as they were marching around the city the wall of jericho mm -hmm. joshua had told the people not to give a war cry he said don't shout don't say a word until the day I tell you. Then you will shout. So Joshua made the priests carry the holy box of the Lord around the city one time. Then they went back to the camp and spent the night there. Early the next morning, Joshua got up and the priests carried the Lord's holy box again. The seven priests with the trumpets marched in front of the holy box, blowing their trumpets. The soldiers with weapons marched in front of them. The rest of the people marched behind the Lord's holy box. During the whole time they marched, the priests were blowing the trumpets. On the second day, they all marched around the city one time, and then they went back to the camp, and they continued to do this every day for six days. 
I hope you're still with me because I know this is quite a long, a long chapter that we're reading here. We're on, we're on, we're, we're on verse 15 now. On the seventh day, they got up at dawn and marched around the city seven times. They marched in the same way they had marched on the days before. But on that day, they marched around the city seven times. The seventh time they marched around the city, the priests blew their trumpets. Then Joshua gave the command, now shout, the Lord is giving you this city. The city and everything is to, okay, so that's actually the end of 16. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to read uh, chapter, uh, verse 17. So I'm going to just jump up from 16 now to verse 20. And verse 20 says, so then the priests blew the trumpets. When the people heard the trumpets, they began shouting. The wall fell down and the people ran up into the city. Now, as I was reading that, I'm sure this is a story that you have heard a lot of times and you're quite familiar with the story. And the message that I felt God strongly wanted me to bring today is what position and what stance do we take in the time of warfare? And that is what we're going to be looking at today. Now, some of you might think, actually, this wasn't really a war because the people of Jericho were in their, in their, inside the city. They had barricaded themselves with the wall. So it wasn't like they were fighting. But one thing we have to understand is that you can take different stance in a time of war. And the stance that the people of Jericho took was one of defense. And they thought it was a good strategy because their wall was quite secure. And so they believed that as long as that wall was up and they were behind that wall, they were safe. So that was the stance that they had taken. And so given that the Israelites were about to go to war, one of the things that first struck me about this, which I want to, which I want to highlight, is that the first thing we see after we read that they were targeting the, the people and the, the city of Jericho in chapter two, in verse two, is that God gave them a promise. And what I want to highlight here is that anytime we go into battle or we find ourselves in a war, and please, war doesn't have to be physical. There are different types of wars. I think this year we can say that we have fought a health war. <laughs> we have fought an economical war. We have fought a political war. Some of you might be fighting a relationship war. So there are different kinds of wars. And in my mind, the way I'm seeing a war is anything that we, are, we find that we are struggling with. And God gave the people of Israel a promise. And as children of God, as long as we are sensitive to the leading of God, God will always give us a promise in a time of trial and tribulation. So we're never fully blindsided. Yes, we might not know how God is going to take us from the promise to the outcome. So the process of how we get from the promise of the outcome, we may not know. And that is where it is required of us as Christians to have faith and to trust in God. But God will always give us a word to stand on during times of trials and tribulations. So my question to you is, with the way that this year has been, what word has God given you? What word are you standing on? The next thing you see after we read about the promise is that God gave the people of Israel clear instructions. And I was hoping that what we can do today is to look at these instructions as guidelines of how we can position ourselves today when we find ourselves in a war or in a battle. So let's look at what the instructions were. The instructions were the army should march around the city six once every day for six for six days and on the seventh day march around seven times seven priests should blow the trumpets and then there should be priests who are carrying the ark of god and on the seventh day the people of israel should make a loud sound now when you hear that instruction does that sound like a war tactic or a war stance to you? Probably not. When I think about war, I'm not thinking about praising 
or carrying an ark of God or shouting. Those are not the things that will come to my mind. And if you think about what we know about any time we find ourselves in battle, our instant reaction is often to either fight or flight. The people of Jericho had chosen a stance of defense, so they were, they were fleeing, they were hiding behind the wall. So automatically you might think the, the obvious thing to do is for the Israelites to attack or to find a way to get in there and to win the battle. You wouldn't think that they should be praising or marching around the wall. And what that made me realize is that a lot of times when we find ourselves in wars or in, 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 in battles, the obvious way or the way that seems like the best way of how to tackle that situation or how to be in that situation isn't always the right way. And more importantly, is it always God's way? So the obvious way or the thing that seems like this is the way I should go, this is what I should do. And everybody's saying, I ah, just do it this way. What's wrong with you? Just, just do it. But sometimes that way isn't God's way. So now let's look at these instructions and see how we can apply this to us now in this season that we're in. The first thing I want to bring our attention to is the seven priests that were blowing the trumpets. Now, as I was doing some reading about uh, the, the, the wall of Jericho, one thing I realized is that trumpets in, the time, in that time was used for many different things. It was used to sound the alarm of war or doing war. It was used to get people to come together to form an assembly or to command a march. And so it was quite important to understand that in this situation, when God told them to blow the trumpet, what, what, what did it mean in this situation? And doing some reading, what I, I came to understand is that the words that God used in the original text was he told the, the priests to, to blow the Shoporeth Jubilee, Shoporeth Jubilee, and that is the trumpet of Jubilee. So God had instructed the people the people, the Israelites, to blow a celebratory sound, to blow a praise sound, to praise God as they were marching around the city of Jericho. And what is the important, because we hear that often to praise God in every situation, even when things are not going right. And what is the importance of praise or what was the importance of praise in this situation, in this war, when they were facing the people of Jericho? And let's look at other places in the Bible to maybe help with this. When we look at 2 Chronicles 20, verses 22, chapter 20, verses 22, we hear about Jehoshaphat. And we hear about how he defeated Moab and Ammon by praising God. He got on his knees and he prayed to God and he asked the people to praise God. And as they were praising God, God sent an ambush and they defeated Moab and Ammon. And if we look at Acts 16, verses 25 to 40. This is the story of Paul and Silas. We know this story so well because we even sing it. They pray, they shout, the Holy Ghost came down, Paul and Silas. We know this story so well. But what is this story telling us? This story also tells us that when Paul and Silas praised God and they prayed to God, what happened was that an earthquake, the, whole, the presence of God came down, there was an earthquake, the gate door flung open, and the chains were undone, the chains were broken. So we begin to see that in a time of warfare, praise is a catalyst to how God moves. When we praise, that's a catalyst for God's actions. Another thing that we see as well is that as the priests were blowing the trumpets around the city, around the city of Jericho, they were making a prophetic sound because that sound they were making wasn't one that was saying that war is coming. It was one that was saying that the war had already been won. So their sounds were reflecting the heart and mind of God in that situation. And if we think about the object of their praise, they were praising God. And what that illustrates is that through their praise, through blowing that sound, they were, they were saying through their praise that this battle was God's battle. 
And they were saying that God was the one leading the charge. And as I was reading that, I began to understand something, is that what the people of Israel, Israel did in that moment was their praise was an outright declaration of relinquishing control to God and saying that this is God's battle, not our battle. And those are some of the key things about why it's so important, even when we don't want to, to praise when we find ourselves in a battle. Because when we praise, what we are doing is we are, we are activating, we're staring up, <laughs> we're allowing for God to move in that situation. When we praise, we are making a prophetic sound because we're praising him for what he's about to do as opposed to the situation we find ourselves in. And when we praise, what we're doing is we are stepping back and surrendering that situation to God and saying, God, this one is yours. I tagged him you in and I tagged myself out. And those are so important to remember during a time of war and trial. Now, let's look at the other instruction. It said, the priests were instructed to carry the ark of God. And I was thinking to myself, why did they, why were they, because if you read the description of the ark, it was quite heavy. So they needed a, quite a number of people, I imagine four or maybe more, to carry it. And I was thinking, why did they carry the ark around the city of Jericho? And that ark of God represented a number of things. One, it was a sign that these people, the people of Israel, of, of Israel, were, were the chosen one. They, had, they, were, they were separate. They stood out from everyone because they were God's people. And having the ark of God with them was to illustrate that they were carrying the presence of God, that God was amongst them. God was moving within them. And so this was God's battle. So literally, what that means was that they were physically carrying the presence of God with them as they were moving around and marching around the city of Jericho. See, back then, they, to, to, to uh, signify the presence of God or to, or to, or to um, show that God was with them, they had to carry the ark. But now, we have the, the presence of God living within us. So the question then becomes, during times of trials and tribulations, how do we carry God's presence with us into that situation? How do we maintain our connection with God in a time of trial and tribulation? And that's a question I have for you today. Now, let's look at the other instruction, the third instruction, which was that the army should march with them. And I was thinking to myself, okay, we, you, you read that chapter with me, and you see that the army didn't really do anything till verse 20. So when they, when they had shouted, and then you know, Joshua said, go and take the city. Up until then, the army, they were quiet. They were silent. And they were just marching like everybody else. And I read something and I thought, this is powerful. Somebody said, the army was silent. And so the only thing that everybody could hear and see and what everyone's attention was on was the sound of the trumpet. So there was no mistake. Make no mistake whose war and whose battle that was. So it was clear to everyone, the Israelites and the people of Jericho, that this battle was the Lord's battle because the only thing that everybody could hear was the sounds of the trumpet. And as I was reading that, God said something to me and I was, <laughs> I was mind blown. He said to me, you see, because the people of Jericho were inside the city, they had no plan of coming out because their war stance was to protect themselves inside the wall. So the army were not anticipating any danger. So they were not on guard that maybe the people of Jericho will come out and do something. God helped me understand that the role of the army as they were marching around the city of Jericho was not to protect the people against danger, but was to protect their praise as the people of Israelites, to protect their praise and connection with God. And that is really important because you see, when we find ourselves in a place of trial and tribulation, 
one of the main things that the devil will try, or the two main things, two of the main, two things that the devil will try to attack during that time is our praise and our connection with God. And the reason why he will try to attack those two things is because if he is successful in attacking your praise, and if he is successful in attacking your connection to God, then you will be left thinking, you will be left thinking that you are alone in the battle. When you are never alone in the battle, when God is always with you. And so if we allow the devil to attack our praise, if we allow the devil to attack our connection with God, then it leaves us in this place of feeling like we are alone. And we are never, never, never alone. So what have we said so far? Let's just backtrack a bit. We have talked about the instruction to praise. We have talked about the instruction to stay connected to the presence of God in times of trials. And we have talked about the instruction to protect our praise on our connection to God in the time of trial. Now let's look at the, other, the next instruction. God instructed the people of Israel to make a loud sound on the seventh day. And in the English, in the easy read translation, we're told that it was a war cry. And if we think about what a war cry is, one of the, one of the aims of a war cry is to stir us up, to strengthen us up. And so what God was asking of the Israelites there was to make a shout of faith. And somebody said that, you know, in that shout, that was also a shout of prayer because they shouted and in their shout, there was an expectation behind that shout that God will move in this situation right now. So in that shout, there was a cry out for God, say, God, move in this situation. And they watched God move. And so when we find ourselves in trials and tribulation, the Lord wants us to cry out to him. The Lord wants us to pray to him. The Lord wants us to bring those things to him, to shout in faith, knowing that if we ask anything in his name, he will answer us. And as we saw at the time, in that time with the people, with the, the Israelites, we see again today that when we call upon the name of Jesus and we call with the understanding that there is nothing else and nobody else that can do what he can do, that it is only God that can do the thing that needs to be done. It is only God that can do the impossible when there is that level of desperation but also that level of confidence that it is God alone that can do it God shows up because God never ever disappoints us and then I want to bring your attention to the number seven if you notice the number seven came up quite a lot in God's instruction so march around the city seven times on the seventh day, march around seven, seven times. So march seven times on the seventh day, march seven times. I hope, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> and also get seven priests to blow the sound, the jubilee sound. And what I came to understand is that the number seven means divine completion. And so what that means is that God never gives us a promise that he has no intention of completing. When God gives you a promise to hold on to, God has every intention that he's going to fulfill that promise and complete what he has started. And we see that quite clearly in this story of the people of the Israelites against the people of Jericho. Because as he was giving them the promise and giving them the instruction, he was also letting them know that there was going to be a completion so that he had said it and he would do it. And I, I quoted this, this thing and I, I heard from PB on Thursday and it stayed with me ever, ever since she said it. We always say that God is the Alpha and Omega. Well, what, do we really understand what that means? To be the Alpha and Omega is that he starts it and he completes it. That is who he is. He's a finisher. 
And so when God has given you a promise, the promise that God has given you in this season, please be rest assured that if he has given you that word, he will be faithful. He will be faithful to complete it because he's a finisher. He completes everything that he starts. So let's, let's, let's think about that now and bring this together. So what is our stance? What is our position in a time of warfare? In a time of warfare, is important that we identify and hold on to the promise of God. What is God telling you in this season? What is the word that God has given you? And if you're not sure what the word is, that is probably a cue to you that you need to go and seek God's face in that situation and hear his word about the situation. Number two, the easy and obvious way of how to handle that situation is not necessarily God's way. It's not necessarily the right way, right way. So if God tells you to do something and you're thinking, God, this makes no sense, it is important that we trust in the Lord and obey him because you see, God has a perspective that we don't have and that is the future perspective. God has already seen what is going to happen tomorrow, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. So when God is telling you to do something today, he is speaking from an informed position, a position that you do not have, you're not privy to. You don't know because you cannot see. So it's important that when we are in a time of trial and tribulation that we trust and we hold on to the instructions that God has given us. Number three is to praise him. See, praise represents a number of different things as we saw today. When we praise, it is our way of stepping back and saying, God have control. See, something to remember as well is that, see, God has supreme authority, but he also gives us choice. And so what that means is that if we do not welcome God into a situation, he's not going to come in and force his way in. Because we can also have choice to do something contrary to the will of God. And so when we read, uh, read uh, scriptures and chapters that say, stand still and know that I am God, that I, or I will fight your battle, that requires for us to step back to allow him to do that. And our praise is our way of declaring and relinquishing our control and saying, God, have your way. Step in. So it's important in a time of trial to praise God. And remember what we said. When we praise, we are making a prophetic sound because we're not praising based on what we can see. We are praising based on what we know about God and what we know that he is capable to do in that situation. The next thing we talked about in terms of our stance and position is to stay connected to God. It can be hard to stay connected to God during times of trial because it can feel like there is so much that we're dealing with and we feel weighed down, we feel bogged down. But as we saw in the, with the people of Israel, they physically carried the presence of God with them. So there was no mistake if God was with them or against them. It was clear that God was with them. So it's important that we stay connected to God. And it is okay. Sometimes you might struggle to do that on our own. And that is why it is important to fellowship and to be, have unity in the body of Christ. Because it's okay to ask for help if we are struggling in our ability to stay connected to God. And things like this, when we come together on a Sunday or we come together on a Thursday, are ways to support us and help us to stay connected when we feel that we cannot do it on our own. The next instruction we had is that it's important that we protect the, the, the two above. So it's important that we protect our praise and our connection to God because once the devil takes that away, then it can make us feel like we're alone and we are never alone. 
And the other instruction we heard today is that God wants us to cry out to him. He wants to hear our heart. He wants to hear the things we're going through. He wants us to cry out to him. But remember, not just crying out to him and leaving it there. Crying and shouting in faith. So crying out and saying, God, this is the situation. And I know that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above. So we cry out and we also make our request known unto him. And the last instruction we heard today is that God is a finisher. He is the alpha and the omega. If he gives you a word, best believe and be reassured that he will complete it because he is faithful to complete it. Now, can I just ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes as we say this prayer. Father God, we thank you for this word today. We thank you because your word came clear. And we thank you because as you have done it for the people of Israel, when they face the people of Jericho, you can do it again. We thank you, God, because even at times of trial and tribulation, we are never alone because you are with us. You gave us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is our helper and he's our comforter. Help us, oh God, during times of trials or during times of struggle, to find the voice within us to praise you. Help us, oh God, to stay connected to you in these times. Help us, oh God, to obey you and trust in you even when everything around us is telling us otherwise. And help us, oh God, to witness in our lives that you are the finisher, that when you start something, you will always, always finish it in the name of Jesus. And as we have prayed today, we're going to hear testimonies in the name of Jesus. People are going to come back and say and talk about how God showed up and fought their battles in the name of Jesus.